from everyone that comes on by Facebook, if you're watching on the continent of Africa, wherever you're watching from today, if you're in India, Pakistan, Nigeria, wherever you are, I'm going to be talking to you about the perfect perspective. So I hope that you're taking down notes today. I'm going to speak to you as a father would to his children. I'm going to speak to you as a father does his son. I want you to know that you're going to have to have the right perspective. And that perspective is everything. You're going to have to protect your perspective. Your perspective is your viewpoint. Your perspective is your viewpoint. There's a mind shift that's going to have to change. A mind shift that's going to have to happen in your life. We call it repentance. I'm going to call it a mind shift. Repentance simply means that you must change your mind. So I've been talking to you about where we are. We have, we have now come to the place in 1 Samuel 22. I'm going to renew these verses of Scripture to you so that you know where we're going, what we're doing, and what we're about. Verse 1. You are with me? 1 Samuel 22. David therefore departed from there, and he escaped to the cave Adullam. We have now arrived at Adullam. That's where we are. I have settled in Adullam, Linda. We are in Adullam. It's a place where justice is going to be found for the people. And when his brethren and all of his father's house heard it, they went there, they went down there to him. And everyone that was in distress, say distress. Distress. And everyone that was in debt, say debt. 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 And everyone that was discontented, say discontented with me. Discontented. What did they do? They gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. And David went from, from there to Mizpah of Moab, and he said to the king of Moab, Let my father and mother, I ask you, come forth and be with you until I know what God will do for me. Smart move, David. Smart move. Look at your neighbor and tell him, smart move. Smart move. Yeah, you, you've got to know when you need to pull back and simply go into the cave and figure out what God is going to do. You've always got to know what is going to be the next move. You should write down for yourself that a leader doesn't have to know everything. He simply knows what his next move is. That's my, my first point to all people who are in leadership. As a leader, you don't have to know it all. You just simply know, need to know what's the next move. I want you to notice with me that David here, David's been in a tough place. David's been in a place where he's been running for his life. He's been running from King Saul. He's running from threats. He's running from a, set, a stressful situation. He has every reason to be discontented at this point in his life because he's already been anointed. Just because you've been anointed does not mean that you will not be discontented. Just because you've been anointed will not mean that you won't face stressful situations. And just because you've been anointed does not mean that you automatically know what to do with money. Though the Bible tells us the anointing will teach us all things, we have to begin to listen to God on a different level. Punch your neighbor in the arm softly and tell them there's some things that you need to learn. If the anointing will teach us all things, then there's some things that I'm going to have to learn. That means there are things that are being held in my spirit that are not being held in my knowledge. And if it's not in your knowledge, then it ain't benefiting you. Because it hasn't gone from here to here. In other words, there's something that has to be cast off of people. I'm going to address this to my family because I can't answer for anybody else out here. But it's this. We cannot possess spirituality and yet have poverty of mind. 
My mind has got to be changed. This is what I'm going to address with you today. My mind has got to be changed. What's wrong with all of these people that have come to David? Something's wrong with their mind. Yeah. Something's wrong in their feelings. Well, something's wrong in their mind. Something's wrong in their money, then something's wrong in their mind. Something's wrong in their character, then something's wrong in their mind. It's not always information that will hurt you, it's misinformation. The hardest people many times to deal with is those who have learned wrongly. Or they have adapted to using mechanisms that they think work for them. Last week, April was talking with us about anxiety. People react in anxiety, and anxiety can become a form of or way of thinking. Most of you would call that a stronghold in, the, in biblical terms. But the reason that they continue to use it is because they think that it worked for them at some point. You'll only use that what you think works until you find out that what you're doing ain't working. Somebody has got to introduce a new way of thinking to you. It's the only way that you'll progress. Now, I know we resist change, but, you know, David David has come to the place of a dull. Has David done anything wrong here? No, David's just been anointed. David's just been doing what he knew to do. But things didn't always go the way he may have thought they should have gone. There's a lot of times that we think things should go a certain way. David said, I just got to pull back here. I'm going to pull into the cave of a dome and I'm going to find out what God's going to do. You may call it a retreat. I don't call it a retreat. I call it a place of gathering. A place of gathering. I'm going to gather myself, gather my thoughts, gather my focus. And I notice very clearly that David called for his father and mother to come down. When mom and daddy get here, then I'm going to find out what God's going to do for me. You know, many things that we, we can say many things about David and his family. There was a lot of dysfunction that happened. There was a lot of bad choices. He had problems with sons. Yet God says that this man has a heart, and his heart is like no other person. He has a heart for me. Just because you have a heart for God does not make you perfect. It does not make you perfect. But God's intention is to bring you into a place of perfection. All these people that have assembled to David, they're not perfect people. They've got all kinds of problems. The problem here is we focus on the problems. Your mind's got to be shifted towards solutions. How's this going to happen? <coughs> so I've been dealing with stress. I want you to look with me in Genesis 35 real quick. Genesis 35. I've been dealing with stress. I'm going to take each one of these and I'm going to pull these things completely apart. I hope you're joining me every week here. Because it is from this point, listen to me very closely. When a man of God decides to pull back into the place of a dome, this is what David did. David is God's man. He is God's man. God's already rejected Saul. He's already rejected the current leadership. But God is yet to install his choice. It was not an overnight process. How many of you know you're going to have to go through process? David had the anointing. David had the know-how. David had the skill. David had the courage. But David did not have the necessary people. Sometimes you're just lacking the necessary relationships in your life to move forward. That's in a time that you have to pull back and say, I will see who God's going to bring to me. I will see who God's going to bring to me. So let's look at how David has an understanding 
to deal with those who are distressed because all of these people eventually become David's mighty men, correct? So let's look at Genesis chapter 35 real quick. Genesis chapter 35. I want you to look with me <coughs> at verse 1. How many of you know that David knew the scripture? David had the scriptures. David had the scriptures. Let's look at Genesis 35 and 1 and it says, And God said unto Jacob, Arise and go where? Bethel. Don't know what Bethel means? Write it down for yourself. It means the house of God. The house of God. Bethel. Beth means house. El means God. House of God. Where does God tell him to go? The house of God. We have a household of faith. We, can, we call this place a house of God. God's just told him, Jacob, get up and go to church. Now, I hope you've come to a place where God doesn't have to tell you that. But God, I've already settled in my heart. Now, what does he tell him? Next, look at it. Tell me what he says. He'll make an altar. No, 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 no. And dwell there. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Dwell there. Live there. Go there. Stay there. Then he tells him to do what? Make an altar. Unto God that what? Appeared unto you when you fled from the face of Esau your brother. Verse 2. Then Jacob said to his household. You've got to know when God is calling you to a certain place, when God calls you to a certain place, you begin to instruct all those that are in your household to do what? Those that were with him, he said, put away from you your strange gods that are among you. Be clean and change your clothes. It's time for a change. Enough is enough. We, we've, we've been here before. Where is Jacob going? He's going back to where he's been before. Stay with me though. Verse 3 he says, Let us arise and go to Bethel, and I will make there an altar to God, who answered me in the day of what? Distress. My distress, and was with me in the way which I went. Now let's back up from there. Mark your place in Genesis 35, 3. What did Jacob just say? Jacob said that he was in a place of distress. And when he was in a place of distress, God visited him. Amen. Say that with me. When I'm in a place of stress, when I'm in a place of stress this is where God will answer me. <laughs> You've got to begin to expect this. Why? I'm going to talk to you about a couple of things before I get there. Go to Genesis 28. Find your place there. And mark it. You can look at a few verses around Genesis 27 in just a minute. But I'm going to talk to you this morning about being a tomorrow thinker. A tomorrow thinker. Jacob has had, God, God's had to speak to him about where he's been in order that God can move him to where he needs to go. How many of you know there's been times that you feel like your life is two steps you know, one step backwards, two step forward. Some of you may feel like your life is one step forward, two steps backwards. You might feel like you're going backwards. Sometimes you've got to go backwards in order to go forward. I'm not trying to get you focused on the past, but what I'm trying to get you focused on here is tomorrow. Because ultimately, you've got to think. Look at your neighbor and tell them, you got to think. You have got to think. If you think twice, you'll probably be smarter than most people in your family. 
if you just simply think twice. You've got to think. You know how many times the Bible instructs us to think? Think on these things. Think on things that are just and lovely and pure. Things that are of a good report. If there's any virtue, if there's any praise. Think on these things. God wants you to think. Most of the time we're trying to feel our way through life. God says, I want you to think. I want you to think about these things. Sometimes you're going to have to think about where you've been. But ultimately you're going to have to think about where you're going. I want to get you to a place where you are a tomorrow thinker. Tomorrow thinkers, I find that most tomorrow thinkers, they are caught in a world of yesterday thinkers. Most people are basing all of their life and where they're going on what they've been through or where the problem that they're currently in. But let me say this to you. Your future family, your future, and your potential, they are crying out to you for not only the thoughts of today, but the thoughts of tomorrow. You've got to get a future focus. God is going to take Jacob to the house of God in order to give him a future focus. There's a moment here that Jacob has that he says, wait a minute, where did life change for me? It changed in the house of God. Come on, family. We've got to get together. Change your clothes because we are going into another day. It is time for things to change. It is time for our life to change. It is time for us to move ahead. You've been where you've been too long. You've been stuck for too long. You've been like you are for too long. Y'all should be looking at each other and, and saying, yeah, yeah, I know that about you. You have been like you are too long. Asa has got it down. He's got the head going. Mm -hmm. You've been like you are for too long. You have been like you are for way too long. What's been wrong? Your perspective. You don't have the right perspective. You don't have a perfect perspective. You don't have a, a perspective where you see the perfect will of God. You may see some good things. You may have some acceptable places, but are you seeing the perfect will of God? You know, sometimes life can, can throw tragedies at us. It can throw obstacles. It can throw challenges. It can throw circumstances. It can throw situations. But if your perspective is fixed, and it's fixed on the perfect will of God, you, won't, you will not be moved away from that which is perfect. So what's going to happen here? There is not enough room in your mind for you to have forward focus and fearful stress at the same time. There is not enough room in your mind, listen to me very closely, because at any moment something can happen and you can react with stress. You can have a distressful thought and it will take away from you all focus of the future. Why? Because you will get your mind on the here and now and you will base it on something in your past. You've got to move away from past thinking and even present thinking and move into a future-focused, fixed mind. A future-focused, forward mind. God is, God, is going to, God is going to remind He's reminding Jacob here. When you were in distress, remember what I did. When you are in stress, remember what I did. I'm going to move you somewhere this morning if you stay with me. You don't have room in your mind to have a future focus and have stress at the same time. Because stress is fearful. Stress is all about fear. You cannot, listen to me real closely, you cannot possess the word can't in your mind and potential at the same time. You cannot possess can't in your mind and potential at the same time. I've been reading to you every... Well, we started the last four Sundays reading from Philippians chapter 4. What does verse 13 tell us? Philippians chapter 4. Pay attention, guys. Philippians 4 and 13 tells us this. I can. Say that with me. I can. I can. Say it like you mean it. Say it like you believe it. Say it like God's Word says it. I can. I, can. I, 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 I get really tired of hearing Christian people say, I, I can't, I can't, I, 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 I can't. 
Stop that. Stop it. Stop it. Your mind ain't lined up with God's word. God's word says, I can do. How many things? All, all things. Now say, I can do all things. I can do all things. Through who? Through Christ. Through Christ, which does what? Strengthens he me. strengthens me. So you've got to get can't out of your mind. Can't has to go. And can has to come into your mind. I can do this. I can get through this. I can run this business. I, 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 can, I can change. I can prosper. My life can change. My situation can change. My job can change. My business can change. Everything can change. Everything can change at the moment that you decide that it can change. God has to speak to you in the middle of your camp and say, you need to remember what I've told you before. Amen. So it doesn't matter if you haven't been this way before. I'm telling you I've been this way before. And you need to listen to what I'm telling you. Because I'm instructing you with wisdom in this way. Potential cannot live in the same place as can because they disagree. Potential is always based on can. Potential is always based on the future. It is never. If you start talking to me about what you can't do, I'm going to say, you're not thinking with potential in mind. You're not thinking with potential in mind. You may be sitting here looking at your checkbook, looking at your bank account, looking at your finances, and going, can this really change? Oh, yes, it can. Oh, yes, it can. Does that mean that I'm promising you an overnight change? No, I'm not. Because your mind doesn't always change overnight. But the problem between where you are and where you need to go and where you've been is one thing standing in the way. It's the thing that's between your ears and it's your mind. Until your mind changes, things are not going to change for you. This is why Jesus went out and preached repentance. Because the kingdom, whenever the kingdom is at hand, the kingdom says, mind has to change. He went out and preached the kingdom. And that the kingdom, he said this, that men should repent. That men should, their mind has to shift. Your mind has to change. When the kingdom is present, your mind has to change. If the kingdom is present, then your mind is going to change. How do I measure the kingdom? I measure it in how much my mind is changing. How much are you walking in the kingdom, living in the kingdom? When you measure that according to how much your mind is changing. How much has my mind changed toward righteousness, towards peace, and towards joy in the Holy Spirit? Because these are the kingdom of God. I can't be stressed out and have peace at the same time. I can't be in debt and be in joy at the same time. I don't enjoy being in debt. Does anybody in here enjoy being in debt? No. Does anybody in here enjoy being stressed out? Well, then you won't have peace. Do you like being discontented with life? That's not a righteous attitude. Well, know what's pulling on you. So let's look here at Jacob. God tells him to go to Bethel, make an altar. This is where God answered you. <coughs> God answers you in the place. He will answer you in the, in the day of your distress. Let me say that again. God will answer you in the day of your distress. Let's look at Jacob. Genesis 28. I want to look at verse 10 real quickly. Jacob went out from Beersheba and he went towards Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and he tarried there all night. Because the sun was set. Say this with me, a dark place. A dark dark place. place. So what did he do? He took the stones of that place and he put them for his pillows. And he laid down in that place to sleep. Verse 12, very important. And he dreamed. And behold, a ladder was set up upon the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it. And he said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon you are laid. To you will I give it, and to your seed. And your seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee, 
And in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. I'm at verse 15 now. Behold, God says, I am with you. I will keep you in all places where you go. I will bring you again into this land. I will not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken of you. Verse 16, and Jacob awakened out of his sleep and he said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. What place is Jacob in? Let's find out. Verse 17. He was afraid. And he said, this is a dreadful place. This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up in early in the morning and he took the stone. Pay attention to what's going on. He took the stone that he had for a pillow and he set it up for a pillar. And he poured oil on the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow. What did he vow? If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothes to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. Say my God. My God. And this stone, which I have set up for a pillar, shall be God's house. And all that shall you give me, surely I will give a tenth unto you. A tenth I will give to you. I'm going to stand up from this point. Your location is important. Your location is important. How important is it to come into this place? It's very important. Is very important. You coming into this place is very important to where your future is going. Because whoever voice that you're listening to, that voice is determining your future. Whoever you are listening to is determining your future. Now you may say, well, you know, I determine my future. Well, when you have voices that speak the wrong thing into your life. You will make decisions and determinations about life that will take you in the wrong direction. Now I want you to back up just a couple of verses from Genesis 28 and I want you to look at, at what has happened to Jacob. And I want you to look at how God is going to change Jacob. I want you to look at Genesis 27:41. Jacob is a twin. Jacob has a twin brother. His twin brother's name is Esau. Verse 41 says, And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. Some people are going to hate you because you are blessed. Does the, has the blessing manifested yet? No, nope, but the blessing has been spoken. You have to understand the whole principle of fathering, spiritual fathering, how God establishes fathers in the earth. Abraham was a father, and he was a father to Isaac. And because he was a father to Isaac, he spoke a blessing over him. You have to understand that God has put in the mouth of someone, someone who is a father, someone who is over you in the Lord, the ability to speak blessing into your life, to speak favor into your life. They can speak it and it will happen. Amen. This is a spiritual principle woven all the way through the scriptures from beginning to end. When God has established a father in the earth, a father has to speak a blessing to his child. Jacob is a twin. Now pay attention. His father has blessed him. 
Esau knows that whoever daddy blesses is going to be blessed. This is something that they all understand without question. That whenever dad speaks a word over my life, it's going to go that way. This is how important the words that we speak are in the earth. Jacob understood this. Isaac understood this. Abraham understood this. That when they speak, the word comes to pass. Whatever I speak, God is going to honor. God is going to... When I speak a blessing, it's going to happen. Esau's mad because daddy has not blessed him in the way that he has blessed Jacob. Let's pay attention. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning of my father are at hand. He knows daddy's about to pass away. I'm going to wait until after daddy's dead and I'm going to kill my brother. Now, there will be people that will want to kill you because you are blessed. They won't be able to figure out the blessing. They won't understand the blessing. Let me, let me establish this with you. You can't understand blessing. You only receive it. You won't understand how it got to you. You don't understand favor because favor is never fair. People will look at your life. Natalie, they will be able to look at your life and they'll say, how did, how did you get there? How did this happen for you? How? How? They will never understand the how because you can't understand how it happens. You can't explain how it happens. You only know that God made it happen because you can't see his invisible hand working all the time. Situations may not look how they ought to look many times, but you know that when the blessing is there, it's going to lead you into the place of favor with God. Amen. God always favors his righteous cause. What's how, what does Esau understand? Things are not going to go as well for me as they are for my brother. So he can't outshine me. Y'all better hear how competitive people are in the earth. If they see that you're blessed, they will try to put you down, put you away, and put you under in order that you will not look as blessed as they are. Oh, people, man, let me tell you, these, these people was competing for the blessing of daddy. Verse 42. And these words of Esau, her elder son, were told to Rebekah, Mama did God win. I'm amazed at what women hear that men don't hear. She sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and she said to him, Behold, your brother Esau is touching you. He is comforting himself by purposing to kill you. It will be comforting. You better hear what I'm telling you. There are jealousy will cause people to do things that are unimaginable. When God showed favor to Abel, Cain couldn't handle it. He said, I'll just take Cain out. Then there ain't nobody for you to favor except me. Jealousy and envy will cause you to do things. Don't you be jealous of somebody else's blessing. Don't you be envious of somebody else's blessing. You need to position yourself in order to receive the blessing. Amen. To receive the blessing, you need to position yourself. Don't, don't expect to be blessed when you won't position yourself to receive the blessing. Now I want you to see something about Jacob. Jacob's means were not what I would call the most righteous because he positioned himself. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you here, Esau is the oldest. He was the firstborn of the twins. In birth order, typically the firstborn son, he would get 90% of the inheritance. The rest of the 10% of the inheritance was split between all the other children. 
So most of the time, this is how things happen through family lineage. The oldest, the oldest son was pretty much considered equal with the father because he was going to be the primary inheritor. But with that inheritance also came the responsibility to oversee the entire family. That's why he would typically receive the most. Because if father died before mother, then the oldest son had to, he took on his mother, all of his brethren, whoever. It was his responsibility to look after the whole family. Something has happened there that we have not seen in this whole story, though. Esau has done something that was not pleasing in the sight of his father and mother. Look at verse 43. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. She's talking to Jacob. And arise and flee to Laban, my brother, to Haran. And tarry with him for a few days until your brother's fury turns away. Well, it was more than a few days. He was there about 15 years. Hmm. Until your brother's anger turns away from you and he forgets what you have done to him, then I will send and fetch you from there. Why should I be deprived of both of you in one day? In other words, Rebecca knows this will not turn out well. These two will kill each other. I've had sons that are like that. I have to break them apart because they kill each other. Somebody's going to get really hurt. Let me tell you, family and domestic disputes, they can be some of the nastiest ones ever. Because yeah. family can be they get real with each other. Mm -hmm. They get real, real. <laughs> oh, you, you stole daddy's blessing. Now, you have to understand here that Jake, Jacob has he has he has fulfilled his name his name means supplanter or deceiver because he was actually being born first listen real closely he was being born first and then all of a sudden Esau came out and the Bible says that Jacob grabbed him by in birth by the heel can y'all imagine this scene? <laughs> Grab him by the heel. One who grasps the heel. There's already a competition between these two. Don't think you're going to get ahead of me. He literally fulfilled his own name. When it came down to birthright and position, he said, you know, Esau was hungry. Jacob said, I'll trade you your birthright for a pot of stew. Esau, because he was vain. Listen to what I'm telling you because I'm talking about having the right perspective. Esau, because he was vain. Vain means you can't see beyond the tip of your nose. He said, what good is my birthright to me if I starve to death? Give me that bowl of, of stew. So he ate it up and Jacob said, mm -hmm. I got my eyes on the future. I've got my eyes on the pride. I've got your birthright. Now all I need is your blessing. I gotta get. I gotta get ahead of you in line. Let me let me say this to you. When you believe in the blessing, you will begin to pursue the blessing. Mm -hmm. Now, the way that he pr pursued it, you may say, "Well, it don't sound right." But God's gonna have to straighten this out on the end because ultimately, is do you want it? And how bad do you want it? How bad do you want it? God's going to take Jacob from a place where he deceived for the blessing to the place where he received the blessing. You better listen to what I'm telling you. I'm cracking open the revelation of this now. He went from the place where he had to deceive for the blessing to the place where he could receive the blessing. How is this going to happen? He has now took off running from Esau because mama's told him, Esau's going to kill you and it's going to be a comfort to him. When dad dies, you're going down, son. He go, and he is a mighty hunter. Esau would probably shoot him with a bow and then drag his body off into the woods, you know. They, they're some crazy people now. Don't tell me there ain't some crazy people in your family. Mm -hmm. I just hope you ain't the crazy one. <laughs> Rebecca said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. Pay attention, I'm in verse 46. If Jacob takes a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do to me? Here's what, 
Esau has already gone wrong. He married daughters of the Canaanites. He's already done this. You can't bless this kind of, you can't bless it. She's already been in Isaac's ear telling him, you can't bless this. Sometimes daddy wasn't listening. And he, he said, Esau, I'm hungry. Go out and get me something to eat. Rebecca hears this and she says, all right. Rebecca understands what needs to happen here. Are y'all listening to me? The Bible says that Isaac's eyes had become dim. He's old. He, he doesn't have sight for the future. He just knows how things have always been done. He should have understanding of this more than anybody because he wasn't Abraham's firstborn son. He was the second. But he understood that he was the begotten son and not the only son. There's a vast difference between the only son and the begotten son. But we know that Jesus is God's only begotten son. But Jesus was the only begotten son in order that you can become a begotten one. Amen. You have to become begotten of a father. She understands here there is no way that Jacob, that Esau can be blessed in his lineage because he has gone outside of the household to marry. This is Bible, folks. You do not yoke yourself with unbelievers. That's right. There, you can't bless the unbeliever. It, the blessing can only come through those who believe. You have to believe the blessing, but you also have to obtain the blessing. Hallelujah. She has told her son, Jacob, stay with me now, stay with me. I want you to go in there and I want you to act like Esau. We're going to get a, we gonna get a, a, a kid goat and we're going to kill him and dress him and we're going to take his hair and fur and we're going to put it on you, Jacob. Now your voice ain't gonna sound like Esau because he was probably a little rough because he was he was a rough tumble dude. Jacob a little more smooth, you know, a little, a little more smooth and refined person. He walks in, places it before Daddy, and says, Here you go, Daddy, in that gruff voice. Now, Isaac, you know, he says, wait a minute. You don't sound like Esau. Come over here, closer to me. He touches him. He said, well, you, you feel like Esau, but you don't sound like Esau. Starts eating. He starts eating that, that goat, and he forgets about it. You know, when you, when you eat, you, you forget about some things. Some of you just need to sit down and eat and forget about some things. And then he, he forgets about it. He says, oh, by the way, come here, son. Let me bless you. This is the moment that Jacob has been waiting on his whole life. Is when daddy puts his hand on him and begins to speak the blessing on him. And the blessing that he speaks on him, listen to me very closely. The blessing that he speaks on him, God repeats over him. Boy, when you, get, when you get this, when you realize how much God invests in the father of the family, that whatever he says is how it's going to go. We don't want to believe this because we think, I can rise up out of this. Esau knew whatever daddy says, that's how it's going to go. I've got to, he comes in later. Jacob leaves with the blessing. Mama tells him, you're going to get killed for this. Run for your life. Esau comes in. I got something for you to eat. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Haven't you already been here, son? No, Daddy, I, I've been out there hunting for this. I, I just got this for you. Isaac says, oh my gosh. What have I done? I have blessed your brother. But, but daddy, can't you take it back? No, I, I can't retract it. Once I've spoken it, it's out there. God's done hurt it. He gonna follow up on it. 
Or y'all got to understand this about God. God decrees a thing and it comes to pass. But God also, because of who he is in his humility, when he marks a man in the earth, when God sets a man in the earth, when he set Abraham, Whatever Abraham said, that's how it would go. Whatever Isaac said, that's how it would go. Whatever Jacob said, that is how it would go. Jacob, in his death, prophesied over all of his 12 sons. And exactly what he said, it came to pass. Some of the things he said, it was not nice. You're a wolf. That's exactly what they became. The Benjamites became like Paul. He was a Benjamite. They were a wolf to devour the sheep. It took Christ to redeem the words of Jacob. Lord, y'all better listen to what I'm telling you here. So what happens here? Jacob runs. Jacob is distressed. It's, it's stressful knowing that you're running for your life because you have taken someone's blessing. You are now running with the word of God. Even though you have deceived for this, is hard for the mind to receive. But he has deceived in order to receive the blessing. But God's got to do something. God's got to change his entire life now. You're, you, some of you, you're running with a blessing, but your mind hasn't changed. Listen, look, look with me again. He is there. He lays down in a dark place. It's night. This is uh, Genesis 28 and 11. The sun is set. He takes stones for the pillows of that place. Your potential, your potential is going to need this. It's going to need a dream. Write that down for yourself. Your potential needs a dream. And let me tell you what stress is. Stress is a dream killer. Doesn't matter how much blessing has been spoken, your mind's still going to have to change. Doesn't matter how much blessing has been spoken, your nature is going to have to change. Jacob becomes Israel. Say that with me. Jacob becomes Israel. He was not born as Israel. He was born as a deceiver. He was born as a supplanter. He was born as one who would grasp the heel. He was born as one who would try to replace him which was first in line. He would replace him which was ultimately in the order of natural lineage in order to obtain the blessing. The ladder. God begins to show him a ladder. This ladder tells me this. A ladder always speaks to me of going up higher. You're going to have to go up higher than where you are. A potential, you have the potential to ascend here to the heavens. God has shown what He gets the blessing. The first thing God shows him is a ladder. You've got to go up higher. You're going to have to change from this point. There's an ascending or a descending that's happening on it. The angels. The angels are messengers. There's a message that you need to hear. The, the stress that you are looking at here, Jacob, in your moment, it is an immediate problem. It is, a, it is a problem. It's a problem when somebody wants to kill you. But your dream needs a plan. Let me say these things to you. Your potential needs a dream, and your dream needs a plan. Say that back with me. My potential needs a dream. And my dream needs a plan. You, you've got to write that down for yourself. You may not know what your potential is, but I can tell you what your potential is by your dream. But I can tell you how far your dream is going to go by your plan. You've got, if you don't know anything else other than your dream, then your dream will begin to tell you what your potential is. Jacob has the potential to go all the way up to the heaven. From earth to heaven. Nothing in between. Nothing to stop him from ascending. This is why I preach to, to entrepreneurs, business owners. You have no ceiling. You have nobody over you. You have no one limiting you except you. You don't have a boss. You don't have a set paycheck. You don't have a set amount an hour. You don't have an hourly wage. You have nothing over you except you. 
You are the one that determines how far you go. When you see it from Scripture, it makes it a whole lot different. So there's a promise that's made at this place called Bethel. Listen to me. A promise is always made at the house of God. A promise is always made of the future in the house of God. What does God tell him? The land where you are laying on is going to be yours. The land in which you are laying on is going to be yours. <coughs> he says your seed is going to increase. This is what you need to begin to expect about your seed. There's so much I could preach and teach here, but I will tell you this. Your tithe is not your seed. Let me say that again. Your tithe is not your seed. Your tithe is not your seed. I want you to realize that when Jacob awakes from his dream and realizes what God is doing, what is the first thing he says? My God, I'm in the house of God. Of all that I have, a tenth I will give to you. People tell us, oh, yeah, tithe, and that's not New Testament. Well, these people were not even in the Old Testament. They were under the covenant of Abraham. He is under the covenant. This is not Levitical law. This is not New Testament law. This is the law of faith. This is the law of love. This is the law of the oath. This is the law of a vow. This is the law of covenant with God. It falls all the way through Scripture. Abraham understood it. Isaac understood it. And Jacob understood it. How did he understand it? From father to son. Father to son. Why is Jacob, why is Jacob repeating this? He got it from Isaac. Who got it from Abraham. Abraham understood it because he was under the order of Melchizedek. God tells him, your seed's going to increase. Your family is going to be blessed through you. You have to understand that your family is going to be blessed through you. My family is going to be blessed through me. How do I know that you're going to be blessed? I call you my spiritual family. I also call you blessed. I expect you to be blessed. I expect everything that you lay your hands to to prosper. I expect, I'm expecting for your mind to change, your business to change, your family to change, your situation to change. Everything that you're doing is going to change. Why? Because I'm speaking blessing over it. I'm speaking favor over it. I'm speaking that things are going to go well with it. The only thing that's got to change here is your mind. Your mind is what's got to change. Because Jacob has, all, he's already ran with the blessing. The blessing is already there, but his mind hasn't changed. He's stressed out. That's why I read to you Genesis 35, because he said that God answered me in the day of my distress. God will answer you in the day of your distress. How? Let me tell you in these ways. Your stress has put you into a sleepy state. You're going to awaken from the sleep that you've been in. Stress is a dark place. The sun has gone down. But my Bible tells me this. This is what I talked to the entrepreneurs about on Tuesday. Psalm 84 and 11 says this. That our God is a sun and a shield. What happens with the sun? S-U-N. The sun. The sun goes down, but the sun comes back up. You may be in a dark place, but God is like the sun. He's going to arise again in your life, and light is going to shine. Amen. I don't care how dark, Amen. how gloomy, how what it seems like right now. The problem that has to change here is this. Jacob has made a stone for his pillow. Listen to me. This is what God's going to do for you. This may sound spiritual. It may sound like an enigma. It may not make sense to you. But when you begin to see what God is going to do, you have laid your head your head, your thinking, your mind has been laying on a rock in a hard place. That's all you see. Ah, oh, Todd, I'm between a rock and a hard place. When you, when you stop thinking about your rock and your hard place, look where God made him and got his mind on the dream. I hope your lights are going off. You've got to get your mind off of your rock and your hard place and get your mind on your dream. Because that's ultimately what's going to change your mind. Because you're thinking about what you're going through, what you're facing, the pressure, the situation. 
This is killing me. All this stress is killing me. That's, yeah, that's what it's pursuing him, just like Esau. I'm telling you right now, get your mind on your dream. Get your mind. What is your dream? What is your dream? Then get your mind on it. Because when you get your mind on it, you will remove your head from that stone and you will do what? You will set it up as a pillar and you will begin. He poured oil on it. Oh, my Lord. Y'all see that, right? Yes. This is all about your perspective. You're, you've got to get the perfect perspective. Your dream will bring you. You may say, well, what if my dream is wrong? I don't care. You need to get your mind off your stress and get it on your dream. Because your mind will begin to create a pathway of how. When you're in the most stressed out place, that's when God will say, I will show you the dream again. That's why Jacob has got to go back to Bethel again because he has forgotten the dream. He has just spent 14 years working for two women when Laban has treated him exactly how he's been treated. But he's going to go through an entire nature change. It's not just your thinking is going to have to change. Your nature is going to have to change as well. Let me finish this out. Because I know your stress is a dark place. It's hard on your mind. But you've got to get your mind off the problem. Get your mind off the problems. Get your mind off the problems. Stop thinking problematic thinking. That's, most people, that's all they think about. It's all they talk about. Whatever you talk about is how you'll walk. Whatever you talk about is how you'll walk about. How, what you talk about is how you'll walk about. You need to walk in problems all the time. You need to be walking in your dreams. Amen. You, need to be walking in, you need to be walking into your dreams. Walking into your dreams. How is Jacob going to receive the blessing of the Lord? Stressed out? No. He's going to have to have a dream. That dream is going to have to stay before him. This is where God shows him his potential of his future. The potential of his future is the gate of heaven. Did y'all just see this? The gate, he's going to possess the... My God, when you get this, he's going to possess the gate of heaven while yet on earth. I said he's going to possess the gate of of heaven while yet on earth. Jesus said this about his church, that the gates of hell will not prevail. There's the gate of heaven and there's the gate of hell. Which one is prevailing in your life? Are you living at the edge of the gate of hell? I'm going through hell, Todd. That's what I hear a lot of people say. My life seems like hell. Well, you must be living near hell's gates. You need to start thinking about your dream and start ascending towards the gate of heaven. Heaven and hell, they are real places. But their influences are also present here. My life ain't going to be hell. He's running for his life. That, that seems like hell, don't it? Yeah. Your brother, when your brother says, I'm going to kill you to comfort myself, it's going to make me feel good to kill you. You don't realize the emotion of this situation. You ever want to kill somebody? They make you feel good. They're going to make me feel good to kill you. This is serious, folks. This is serious family. This is some serious family dysfunction going on. Jacob rises up early. I'm telling you, a new day has dawned. A new season has come. You're going to take your pillow where you've been laying your head. That's what you've got to do. You've got to begin to learn to take your mind, your thoughts, your energy where you've been laying your head, and that's where you're going to set up a foundation for the future. Your foundation for the future is in your mind. Listen to me real closely. The foundation of your future is right here. It's not out there. It's right here. The foundation of your future is right here, not out there. As a man thinks, so is he. If you think you're a failure, you will be. If you don't think that you're successful, you won't be. You've got to begin to think. You've got to begin to think in terms of your dream. Where are you going? Listen, I've been to, in all these places. I have walked in a dream, lived a dream, and then stopped dreaming. And had to come back and start dreaming again. I'm dreaming again. When you dream, you will begin to live. When you stop dreaming, you will stop living. You can't receive all of God. You may fulfill a dream. So what? 
move on to another one. Find a new one. Find something bigger. Find, ask God to show you right in the middle of your stress, what is the, what, where am I going from here? Show me the ladder. Show me, you, we call it the ladder of success. Show it to me. Show me how I succeed from here. Show me how I go up from here. Show me how I grow from here. Show me how I go up from here. Some of you feel like you're stuck. You know, I'm just hanging on the bottom rung of the ladder. No, you're not. You are not stuck. Stop saying it. You're having what you're saying. Stop saying it. You are not stuck. There is nothing here on this earth that is determining the circumstances of my life except my decisions. You've got to stop getting... You got to get out of this victim mentality. You are not the victim to your business. You are not the victim to your job. You are not the victim to anyone except what is your mind is captive to. The Bible tells us that we take captivity. We take captive the thoughts that are against the knowledge of God. Are you taking those thoughts captive? Are you walking around saying, "I can't. I'm stuck. I'm dead"? No. I am the blessed of the Lord. Amen. I I prosper wherever I go. That's right. Isaac went in the midst of a famine. Jacob understood this. Listen to me real closely. When you have seen your daddy prosper in the midst of what looks like a famine, you will believe the blessing. My God, I'm going to preach now. There was a famine in the land. That's what the Bible says. Read your Bible. And it says it was worse than the one in the days of Abraham. And it says that year, Isaac sowed. And he increased a hundredfold. That's right. Boy, let me tell you, Jacob and Esau would both be wanting that. Because when there's a famine and everybody else is starving and Daddy is prospering a hundredfold, you're sitting around going, I don't know what he's doing, but I want some of that. That's why you can't understand and you you can't you can't figure out how blessing works. Blessing works because God has favored you. You've got to begin to believe that. I don't have to prove that to anyone when I have received the blessing and favor of the Lord. That's, I was sitting in that church over there the other night and I thought, I don't, I don't have to stand up and hoop and holler to try to, to prove to God that I love Him because He's already proved to me that I'm favored. Amen. Whatever I say, whatever I do, wherever I go, I'm going to be blessed. When I, listen, I understand my position as a spiritual father in the earth. I'm not just a spiritual father under this roof. When I walk into Seagulls on Tuesday at 12 p.m., I'm a spiritual father there. I am who I am by the grace of God. And wherever I go, the grace of God is on my life. Grace That's means right. favor if you didn't know that. That's right. That favor, God favors a righteous cause. God favors it. Do you believe that you're favored? Mm -hmm. then you, if you don't, then you need to start speaking it. Maybe if it would come out of your own mouth, you would begin to believe it. Do you believe it? I believe it. I believe that everything I lay my hands to will prosper. I believe that wherever I go, that God will give it to me. Amen. I'm, I'm dreaming. There ain't nothing wrong with dreaming. You need, to, you need to stop thinking in terms of stress and how hard the world is. And I just can't seem to get ahead. Stop saying that in your mind. That's all you're going to see. Whatever you look at the longest is going to become the strongest. Whatever you talk about is what you're going to bring about. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to happen in your life. You will not be able to separate you from your words nor from your thoughts. You're going to have to start thinking different. That's the only thing that had to change with Jacob right here. Your thoughts has got to change. Stop looking at Esau and look at me. Esau might have a knife in his hand, a bow in the other but he won't be able to find you. God can make you disappear. God can make your situation disappear that quick. One day, you are one decision from your future. You are one decision from your whole future changing. Where is that decision going to happen? Right here. I believe that. Go ahead and stand up because I know you're tired and it's been long. Where I used to lay my head, I don't lay my head no more. I didn't pour oil on that thing. My head used to lay in the place of distress and fear and anxiety and all that. And how am I going to get through this? And I'm looking at those numbers and everything looks like it's going into the negative, going into the minus. Nope. If God's for me, 
Who's going to be against me? It doesn't matter who stands up against me. It doesn't matter who discredits me. It doesn't matter who speaks evil about me. It does not matter. You can't curse that which God has blessed. Amen. I don't care if all Amen. the witches in the land, if they got, if they all got together and cursed me, hexed me, put spells on me, they can't curse what God has blessed. Amen. Can't happen. Ain't gonna happen. Amen. Even even Balaam and all of his misunderstandings of who God was, he understood this. If I curse them, it ain't gonna matter because God gonna keep blessing them. That's right. He understood that. When you have the blessing of the Lord. And it adds no sorrow to it. The blessing of the Lord makes rich and it doesn't add sorrow to it. When you understand the blessing. See, I, I already got a father's blessing. I receive a father's blessing by positioning myself as a son. I, I receive a father's blessing in the earth by positioning myself. This is why the message of father and son is so important. Because God always works down through family. He always works down through fathers. That's why he said, I got to turn the heart of a father to the children because it can't be about him. He's got to speak the blessing into them. I said, it can't be about him that he has to speak the blessing. You know what delights my heart? This is how I know, Philip, that I have the heart of a father. It tickles me when I see you blessed. It tickles me when I see your life change. It, I mean, it does something for me. I'm like, ah, yeah. <laughs> why? Because I understand. I've watched my own natural sons when they're when they out on a soccer field. And I was like, yeah, that's my boy. Yeah. yeah. That's him. Mm -hmm. Ain't nobody got to know my name. Ain't, gotta, ain't nobody got to know. A father always has in mind his children. Why? Because he loves them. Mm -hmm. He loves them and he says, that's my boy. Yeah. That's my daughter. I love seeing them succeed. I want them to go beyond where I ever went. That's right. That's right. I, so what if you outdo me? Good. That was the whole purpose. Yep. Outdo me, please. I want you to have more money than I got. I want you to have more everything than I got. Because if I'm a father, your life should be multiplying. That's why God keeps saying to him, you're going to multiply. You're going to multiply. You're going to multiply. You're going to multiply. Abraham believed he was going to multiply when he didn't have anything. Jake, Isaac believed he was going to multiply. How? Because God gave him Rebecca. God's always going to give you a means to multiply. It's already in your hand. You've got to look at what's in your hand, family. You've got to look at what's in your hand. I told you this last week. This is my last thing. When something comes into your hand, what are you looking at it as? When money comes into my hand, I'm not looking at where am I going to spend it. First thing that hits my mind is, how am I going to multiply this? Why? Because I believe that God will give me the knowledge, the wisdom, the know-how, to know how to multiply. He will give it to you. He is the giver of witty inventions. Proverbs 8 and 12. He will give you knowledge of witty inventions. You are one idea from your whole life changing. You are one idea from your life changing. Some of you already got ideas in your mind, but they ain't ever coming out here. Yet you got to get them from out here to out here. One idea will change your life. One idea will make you a millionaire. One idea will change your entire financial situation. Not only change yours, but will change the future generations. It will change your children and your children's children and your children's children's children. That's how blessing works. That's how blessing is supposed to work. Blessing ain't supposed to just fall on your life. God doesn't just have me in mind. You've got to get that. He doesn't have me in mind. He has you in mind. And not only you in mind, but everyone who will listen to you. How are they going to get blessed? They're going to get blessed through me. Then they're going to get blessed through you. God is a God of blessing. Yes. He is the God of blessing. He is the God of blessing. Say that way. He is. He is the God of blessing. He is the God of blessing. And he's my God. Yes. I believe that. Yes. See, religion will try to rise up and say, and you, you, you just thinking that. Yeah, I am. And you watch me just keep on thinking it. You watch me just keep on Amen. thinking. Religion was trying to say, oh, yeah, knowledge will puff up. Yeah, or watch what the knowledge of God will do when you don't have constraints in your mind anymore. When you are out beyond the captivity of poverty mindedness and you have taken captive the, the thoughts that are against the knowledge of God. 
God ain't out to get you. God is out to bless, bless you. you. Amen. But the problem is your mind has got to change. Your mind has got to change. you got to open up your mind. Father, I am so thankful today that first of all, first, you are a good God. Yes, you are. You have been so good to me that every day of my life there should be a permanent smile plastered on my face because all that you have already done. But I know this, I need the right perspective of my future. For you said in Jeremiah, I know the thoughts that I have concerning you, says the Lord. They are thoughts of a hope, a future, and an expected end. I am expecting to receive the blessing of the Lord, the favor of the Lord. All that you have destined in mind that I could possibly receive in this lifetime and the next. I'm coming to the gate of heaven this morning. I'm coming towards the gate. I'm climbing that ladder. I'm watching the angels as they ascend. There's messages coming down. There's messages coming down from heaven. It's coming down the ladder. I believe that the message that I need to hear, the message, the next message that's going to change my life, I'm going to hear it. I'm going to position myself at the ladder in order that I may climb and ascend to the gate. I'm going to receive all that the gates of heaven have for me in this life. The kingdom now. The kingdom coming forth in this lifetime right now. Do you want that today? Do you want that today? Do you want the kingdom or do you want more of what you've already had? I don't want more of what I've already had. I've already had enough of that. I'm moving on into my future. God, I ask you right here, right now, over my family, that you begin to restore, as you did with Jacob, you begin to restore dreams. If they've gotten to that place where they didn't dream anymore, that you remind them, just like you had to remind Jacob, go back to Bethel, go back to the house of God, and remember what I did there. Remember when I was in the, when you were distressed, I gave you a dream. When you were stressed out, I gave you a dream. You've got to get away from your stress and get into your dream. You've got to get away from your stress and your mind and get into your dream. I want you to go home today. I want you to dream again. I want you to lay down tonight and I want you to dream again. I don't want you to lay your head on that hard place, that stressed out place this week. I want you to rise up and anoint that thing. Call it a pillar. This is old. This is this has become a foundation for me. I'm moving on from distress. I'm moving into the place of becoming a mighty man, a mighty woman of God. I'm going to become like David's mighty men. I'm going to do extraordinary exploits in the earth. I'm not going to live an average life. I'm going to live an extraordinary life. I'm going to live a successful life. I'm going to climb this ladder. I'm going to move towards success. I am going to possess the gates not only of my enemy, but I'm going to possess the gates of heaven while yet here on the earth. I'm going to have, I'm going to have more than enough. I'm going to obtain like precious faith. I'm going to obtain through asking my Father who gives every good and perfect gift. If you need something this week, ask your Father. Ask Him. He will cause it to come to pass. We are thankful today. And we praise you, Holy Father. I thank you for my family. I call them blessed. I call them prosperous. I call them kings in the earth. And I thank you for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want y'all to go out of here.